Hey, what's going on guys? My name is Hamish Hodder and we are back with another video. Today, we're doing another individual stock analysis. I haven't done one of these for a while. I keep saying that I'm gonna do these regularly, uh, but I don't and I apologize for that. But today we've got a really exciting one. I'm gonna be looking at Microsoft. Um, so this is a massive corporation, of course. Um, it's actually the second biggest company in the world, actually, at the moment. It's very close to taking over Apple at this point uh, since Apple stock price has fallen 25% in the last couple of months. And I think uh, Microsoft has only fallen 8%. Um, so they're rivaling for the top position of the biggest company in the world. So I thought I'd talk about the other one since I've already done a video on Apple. Um, of course, if you want to check that out, I'll leave a card to it up there, um, which you can check out after this. Um, but as per usual, in these videos, we're going to start off with the same structure. We'll start off with a company overview. What is the company? How do they make their money? Uh, then we'll jump into the economic moat and we'll talk about that in, an, in a qualitative sense and a quantitative sense. Um, then we'll have a look at the management team. Um, how effectively are they investing within the business as well as how are they managing their debts and how much debt do they have? Then what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the value matrix to see what kind of return we could expect to get on Microsoft stock over the next 10 years. And lastly, of course, we're going to do a valuation and I'm actually going to go through all three of my valuation methods in this video. Very exciting. Uh, and we'll see if any of them give us a buy signal uh, and if any of them give us a sell signal or if we think it's just a hold at the current stock price. Just before we get started, I need to say that I am not a financial advisor and I'm certainly not your financial advisor. Everything here is just for educational and entertainment purposes only. I don't know your personal circumstances. So if you are going to be making any financial investments, please consult a financial advisor. Hit subscribe if you enjoy these kind of videos so I know that you wanna see more of them. But for now, let's jump into it. All right, so I'm sure most of you know what Microsoft is as a company, but essentially they're an American multinational technology company that was actually founded all the way back in 1975. The company was founded by Bill Gates and Paul Allen and is primarily known for its computer software, including Microsoft Windows, Microsoft Office, and Internet Explorer, as well as other hardware products such as the Microsoft Surface and Xbox gaming consoles. In terms of revenue, they break down their revenue into three different categories. The first one is productivity and business processes, and this includes most of their software, including the Office 365, uh, as well as LinkedIn, which they recently acquired. The second section, or the second segment, uh, is Intelligent Cloud, which takes up 29%. Uh, and the last one is more personal computing. Uh, and this includes things like the Windows operating system, uh, their gaming consoles and other hardware, such as their laptops. Uh, and that proportion is the biggest proportion and that makes up 39% of their revenue. The company currently has a market capitalization of 853. They have a PE of 47 and they pay a dividend of about 1.8%. So let's talk about their moat. And when I mean moat, I'm talking about some kind of long-term term competitive advantage that's going to allow them to continue to thrive in their industries. Um, now, I won't stick around too long on the qualitative moat because I think that it's pretty basic. Uh, their strongest qualitative moat is obviously their brand. Um, they have a really powerful and reputable brand uh, that people will seek out over other inferior brands when looking for things like laptops um, and, and uh, other things that they, they sell their hardware and their consoles. Uh, in terms of software, they sort of have an industry standard moat there. Um, the Office 365 is pretty industry standard. Uh, oper Windows operating system is the standard uh, when it comes to laptops and computers that are not uh, Apple. Um, so that's pretty self-explanatory. But what, I, what I'm really excited to jump into is the numbers and see what kind of quantitative moat we can identify. And what I mean by this is we, we're looking to see if they have strong growth in the four key areas, which are sales, earnings per share, equity, and free cash flow. And if they have strong growth in all of those areas over time, then it indicates to us that they do have some kind of competitive advantage that's continuing uh, to allow them to expand their market share and continue to grow in that industry. Unfortunately, the growth numbers for Microsoft have just been really disappointing. In terms of sales, their long-term growth is 7% uh, and it's been about 7% every single year. Uh, in the last year, they grew at 14.3%, which is really impressive, um, but over the long-term, uh, it's under 10%, so that's quite disappointing. In terms of EPS, this is horrible. Their long-term EPS growth is only 3%. Um, and in many cases, their EPS has been going down. In the last year, their EPS was down 35%, which is quite a lot. Um, so that's really disappointing and not something we like to see. In terms of equity, over the long term, they've got 9% or 8.5%, which is really good. Um, that's quite a good number. But then it's just been declining over time, only 5% over the seven years, 
pretty much 0% over the three and five years. And we've actually had negative, uh, had equity go down in the last year, which is really, really disappointing. And in terms of free cash flow, a very similar story, 8% over the long term uh, and sort of getting worse and worse, except for that three year uh, average uh, where they had 11%, but in the last year, only 2.8%. So from just looking at those numbers, I don't think we could say that Microsoft does have a wide economic moat. They certainly haven't demonstrated it uh, by continuing to perform really exceptionally. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's easily identifiable. Uh, and that is a really core component because if they don't have an economic moat, if they aren't growing consistently over time, then how can we expect or be confident to expect that they're going to be able to continue to do that in the next 10 years? So let's now talk about management and we'll start by talking about how they've invested within the business, how effective their investments have been at getting a return on those internal investments. And for that, we always look at the ROIC, the return on invested capital. And we like to look at this over a five-year period and a one-year period. Over the last five years, they've averaged an ROIC of 15.2%. Uh, which is really, really strong. That's quite impressive. That is perfect. It's exactly what we like to see. Uh, in terms of the last year, they had uh, an ROIC of 12%. So this is also great. It's above 10%. But what's disappointing is that it's shrinking over time. And if we look at Microsoft's ROIC over the past 10 years, it's kind of just been shrinking over time as they've been getting less and less efficient. And this kind of makes sense because their income really hasn't grown as we saw by their APS. But of course, they're keeping this money within the business, which is expanding the amount of capital they have. So the return that they're getting versus the capital is always shrinking over time. And that generally happens with older businesses that get to too big to continue to grow at high rates. So let's now have a look at their debt management. Do they have any out of control debt obligations? First, we'll look at the current ratio. They have a current ratio of 2.9, which is excellent. That's well above the two minimum that I look for for a current ratio. Um, and then in terms of the debt to equity ratio, they've got one of 2.13 which is not so great um, because they've got quite a high amount of debt relative to their equity. And this isn't inherently bad. It doesn't mean that we can't make an investment here, uh, but it does increase the uncertainty of those future cash flows because if they don't manage their debt properly, if there is some kind of mismanagement there, then those cash flows might not even happen. So it just increases the uncertainty surrounding them and it probably increases the return that we should demand on this stock uh, because of that added debt. So let's now jump over to the value matrix and see what return we could expect to get over the next 10 years. Now, of course, just a reminder, if you haven't already and you want access to the spreadsheet that I'm using in these individual analysis videos, you can get it for free. First link in the description below, but let's now jump over to the value matrix. So the value matrix for Microsoft in the way that I've set it up right now is really, really sad actually. Um, and I'll, I'll go through what I've done here. So in terms of growth rates, um, analysts are expecting 13% over the next five years. Um, and I've just picked a number of growth rates that are a little bit more conservative than that because I don't think that's very achievable considering their history. So I've picked growth rates from between 3% uh, and 15% for the next 10 years. And I think that's pretty fair. I don't think it's unreasonable to think that Microsoft will stop growing considering that, in, in I mean, they dropped their EPS by 35% this year and over a five year period, their EPS is down almost 4% per year. So I don't think that's unreasonable to expect that they could grow as slow as 3%. I probably should have negatives in this growth chart considering um, the history of the company. And then we've got the PE ratio. Now the current PE ratio is 50 which is insanely high. Um, and I, I looked back over the historical chart for Microsoft and besides the past couple of years, their EPS, uh, sorry, their PE ratio has sort of bounced between 10 and 20. Um, so I went a little bit beyond that, a little bit less conservative and I went between 10 and 30. Um, and th that we still have a really, really bad outcome for Microsoft. And it's just amazing to me. And uh, it, I mean, if they grow at 12% per year from here and they get a 20 PE, um, that means that because their PE is so high right now, you'll only make a 3% return. Now, of course, this is just my preliminary analysis of Microsoft. I don't know why they have such a massive PE um, and I, I don't understand. I don't know what their actual growth rate could be. Maybe it could be a lot higher because there's some certain acquisitions that they're going to be making uh, and that sort of thing. Um, 
But of course, I'm being conservative because I don't know a lot about the company and this is just my first look at it. So um, I, I would definitely be looking further into the company if you're going to be making an investment. Make sure you understand why they have a high PE and understand whether or not that's going to be coming down over time um, because historically speaking, that PE should be coming down to between 10 and 20 in the next 10 or 20 years. So let's finally do that intrinsic valuation and we'll go through the three different methods that I use and see if any of them show us a buy. Now, to be clear, this is just the first couple of hours of research that I'm doing into Microsoft. So these growth rates aren't accurate in any way. Um, they're not a growth rate that I would use and be confident in using uh, before making an investment in Microsoft. Um, I would have to do a lot more research before I do that. This is just simply an example of a potential growth rate and what the potential buy price would be based on that growth rate. So that's just uh, just to be clear about that. This isn't sort of my final valuation. This isn't the be all end all. Um, this is just sort of an example to show you how you can use the calculator. Uh, and if you come to a growth rate that's similar, then the buy price would be pretty similar. So if we start with the margin of safety method using the manual buy zone calculator, of course, we have to input a bit of data on the side. We've got the EPS, the time frame over 10 years, the current stock price, the margin of safety, and the required return. Now I've lowered the required return from 15% to 13 because I'm assuming that we're going to get 2% from the dividend. I'm also assuming a growth rate of 8%, which is their historical equity growth rate, uh, which is usually a good indicator of where the company is going in the future. And that actually gives us a fair value of $30 per share, which is pretty tragic, which means the buy price is $15 per share. Uh, and, and the current stock price is 111. So that is, the margin of safety method is giving us um, a price that is really, really low. Um, and that's just basically because they're priced so high at the moment. They're priced at a 50 PE. If we then go ahead and do the payback time calculator, we take the free cash flow and we grow it at 8% per year, which is how quickly they've grown their free cash flow over the long term. Um, and of course, they have a market capitalization of 845 billion at the current time. And that gives us a payback time of 14 years. Um, and our cutoff is eight years. So that's well above uh, the payback time, which means that it is not a buy at the current price according to the payback time calculator. If we change the market cap to get a payback time of eight years, we can see that the market cap in which we would be willing to pay in order to get that eight year payback time would be $370 billion for the entire company. And that represents roughly a 55% drop uh, in the stock price. And then lastly, we've got the 10 cap method of using the owner's earnings formula uh, by Warren Buffett. Uh, of course, I've just quickly calculated the owner's earnings, uh, roughly speaking, to be about 35.7 billion. Uh, so that would mean that the 10 cap price uh, that we would be willing to pay uh, would be about 357 billion, which would mean that the price would need to drop uh, by about 60% or about 58%. So a long way off, um, but the, the 10 cap method and the payback time both gave us a pretty similar valuation, about 370, uh, $360 billion for the entire company, uh, which is still a massive drop from where it is right now. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, make sure you leave a like and let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. If you haven't already, make sure you hit subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of the videos coming out in the future. But I hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.